I'd like to welcome to show Richard Newpert. How are you doing, my friend? Doing just fine. Thank you. Glad to see so, you, Alex. I appreciate you being on the show. Um, you know, I've never had an educator come on the show to talk about a film movement before. And uh, generally speaking, isn't that something I've done? But the reason why I wanted to bring you on was I wanted to talk about all things French New Wave. And I know a lot of people listening are going, oh my God, are we really going to sit here and talk about the French New Wave? We are, but the reason I wanted to bring you is because I wanted to show filmmakers today what these renegade filmmakers were doing back then and how th what they were doing can help us today in our new kind of world that we live in, which is these micro-budget, low-budget, run-and-gun kind of filmmaking, which we now have the ability to do at a much more affordable rate than they did yeah. back then, and they were still doing it back then. So before we get started, uh, can you explain to everybody who's never heard of this, what exactly is the French New Wave movement? The French New Wave was an explosion that really had never heard, happened before or since, I don't think, in motion pictures. Uh, a culture of people who were all under 30, which was kind of unusual at the time, ended up making their first motion pictures. They shot their first features, most of them, between like 1958, 1964. Um, so what happens is Paris has this uh, just sort of a burst of new young energy on the screen uh, at a time when the average director had to be 50 or 60 and work their way up the system. Uh, you suddenly had these people 30 years old and other making movies. They made cheap movies for us, and some said they were a sexy new movies for really a new generation. Generation. And the reason it's called a wave is that between in that really four, five, six year period, 120 different people got to make their first feature film. And then some of them, like Jean-Luc Godard and Claude Chabrol, are making one or two a year. So it's just these hundreds of new movies are suddenly coming out at the same time out of Paris. And it made Paris, once again, sort of the center of the film universe, really. And there was... So it's an explosion of new technologies, yeah. Yeah, there, there was just nothing like this that had ever happened before and for, for people to have an understanding. In the time period, filmmaking was very kind of textbook. It was kind of like wide shot, close up, edited in a certain way. It was almost formulaic in, in a way. And especially for your audience, I mean, uh, Jean-Luc Godard, who's the last one still living of the bunch mm -hmm. um, and still making movies, um, he famously said in the early 60s, thank God I didn't get into the state film school. They turned down. Otherwise, I would have learned to set my camera where everybody else sets it. I would have learned to edit like everybody else who shot reverse shots. I would have learned to light like everybody else with a whole bunch of three-point lighting, lighting. And instead, he said, I never learned those rules, so I never had to follow those rules. So there was this real excitement that they were aware of the fact they were working outside the system, on the edge of the system. Uh, they were criticizing mainstream movies as critics first, then started making movies. So it really was a brash new young generation, very male. There were a couple of women. Uh, that was really just trying to take on the French establishment and make movies that they just thought were appropriate for them. And they were. And that's really what you should do. And then they were basically, yeah. they were film critics, basically. They decided, you know what? These guys don't know what they're doing. Oh. I'm going to do it. They learned in cine clubs. And this is one of the things. I help run a nonprofit art house here in Athens, Georgia. And one of the things that was essential at this era was they went to movies. They went to the Cinematheque. They watched Silent Myrna movies. They watched Howard Hawks movies and Hitchcock movies. And they didn't want to replicate them, but they wanted to learn. So once in a while, when they actually started to think, oh, I'm going to tell a new story in a new way, but how would Hitchcock treat this? How would Fritz Lang treat this? Oh, I think I'll have a long take in this sequence. So they were also building film history in. They taught themselves film history and film aesthetics rather than going to necessarily to be taught here are the most important movies and how to do things. So it was, it was really a, a brash, exciting kind of movement uh, at a time when youth was really exploding. We also got to think about 1950s. This is a time when radio stations are starting to aim at certain segments of the audience. And there's really a whole new audience at the same, same time in the teens and in their 20s who are looking for something new in music, something new in, in literature even, but especially something new in the movies that's going to be theirs. And it became the French New Wave. And since you brought him up, Hitchcock, uh, you know, during yeah. during his early career, he wasn't really considered a serious filmmaker. He was kind of like a popcorn filmmaker of his time, kind of like Spielberg was when Spielberg yes. was coming yeah. out. They were like, he's not a, you know, he just makes big movies that people like to go watch. He makes popular movies. He doesn't make, he doesn't make cinema. Yeah. He makes movies. Um, and yeah. Truffaut was the first serious uh, cinematic um um uh director that gave 
Hitchcock all the credit that he deserved with that amazing interview that he did years ago, correct? Yes, I hope everybody's seen the Kent Jones movie, the yes. Hitchcock Truffaut documentary that just came out a couple years ago uh, as well. Yeah, and in fact, what Hitchcock and Truffaut just sat down and talked through his career in different ways. And, and actually, Truffaut had, had interviewed him in the 50s. Uh, when he was really young, so this guy's like 20 years old, Truffaut, and he kind of hangs out and finds out Hitchcock's in France and goes to ask, could, it, could he interview him? Um, Truffaut and these guys, they're the first ones who walked around with new little Nagra tape, these little portable quarter-inch tape recorders and would interview people like Hitchcock. And and, they, and usually they're used to being asked, what's it like to be with Grace Kelly on a scene, or, or Cary Grant? Instead, these guys are asking about his lighting choices. They're asking him about his vision of the world. So that early auteurism, they really wanted, you know, take him seriously at a time other people said Hitchcock movies are like going to the amusement park, you know, they're just very well-oiled machines. And these guys wanted to show, no, there's a soul to them. Um, so yeah, they, they really wanted to investigate mise-en-scene. They used to famously say things like, oh, camera movements are, moral, are moral issues. Um, so everything about lighting, everything about camera work, they just kind of saw it almost as a religion. And I think a lot of independent filmmakers today um, need to get can touch it with that sort of aspect of really just a sort of fetishizing of certain aspects of cinema. Uh, but anyway, yeah, they really brought a new attitude toward toward much of the cinema. Uh, Claude Chabrol and Eric Romer wrote the first book on in the 1950s uh, on his career, like right up to 1955. They wrote a book right then. Um, so they were really celebrating certain certain filmmakers and were inspired by them, but they didn't want to make Hitchcock-like movies. They wanted to make personal films about their own lives. Now, what are some of the characteristics of a French New Wave film? Typically, they're going to be uh, set in contemporary time. These are not costume dramas. These are not Star Wars. They're not trying to do science fiction. Um, in fact, a couple of them, one of them famously said, you know, most of the movies about young couples today are made by 60-year-old guys who don't remember what it's like to fall in love. Uh, so they wanted to tell stories about themselves, young men and young women, uh, and the problems they face. So they tended to be shot on location. Uh, kind of like the Italian neorealists and stuff, they shot in the streets. So uh, some of their first films were like, somebody'd say, oh, your, your mother has a really nice apartment. Can we shoot there? I mean, they would shoot in friends' apartments. They would shoot in their favorite cafes, on the streets, etc. That's why in some of these movies like Godard's Breathless, you see people sort of looking at the camera confused. They're just out on the street shooting without permits. Um, so you shoot on location, uh, use as few crew members as possible. And one of the things, especially in a digital age, one of the things to think about is these people are starting to use cameras and new recording devices like the Nagra tape deck that had just come out in the late 50s, uh, where one person can just sling a, a magnetic tape recorder around their shoulder and hold a microphone. And instead of having a sound truck or recording on 35 millimeter optical track, you know, you got one person as the sound department. They started using equipment that was made for news gathering. So they use really lightweight 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter cameras. They were crystal synced up to a tape recorder. Nobody had done this before. So people thought it was unprofessional. Well, they said the same thing about Sean Baker making Tangerine on an iPhone. It's that same sort of notion that you use what equipment you can afford and then make it a, a story, tell a story that's equivalent. And they used and, everyday language. They didn't use fancy formal language. They had scripts that were they used to call sort of plan of action script. I got an idea. Here's a couple of things we're going to shoot today. They weren't these carefully polished scripts because they weren't approved by some banker. They weren't approved by some producer. They'd go out and find their own cash and really be their own producer or find some really amazing young producer who says, okay, I trust you guys. Here's $50,000 to make a movie. And did, when you in the scripts that they were using, were they were they kind of like a scriptment, more like an outline, um, or did they have some dialogue in it? How how exactly did they lay these out? It depended from filmmaker to filmmaker, and that's one of the great things about the new wave. They're all different, right? So um, Jean Luc Godard might show up in the morning with some scraps of paper and hand it to his actors in Breathless and and things like that, and the actors were just like, "What is this? It's like making a silent movie." Uh, we just learn our lines. He says, don't worry about it. We're going to shoot it silent. I'll have you dub it in later. Um, and then others had really careful, Claude Chabrol would have these very carefully worked out scripts, at least a scene to scene. But a lot of times people didn't know where they were going by the end of the movie. Uh, they'd rewrite them as they went. The actors got to help decide things. And that's the other thing about it. They're not using big professional named actors. They're using, you know, they're using friends. They're finding actors who they like playing bit parts in other commercial movies. And so they'll go up to somebody like Claude Briali, who had played a couple bit parts, and they say, hey, look, I thought you were great in that minor part there. How would you like to be in my movie? I can only pay you 5,000 bucks, but I, I, you'll be the lead. 
And the person had to decide, do I want to make more money playing a minor character in a commercial film, or do I want to try being the lead? And then these became the new stars of the French New Wave. So they're going to make actresses and actors into French New Wave stars by having them in movie after movie after movie. Anna Karenina for, for, uh, for Godard, Jean Moreau was making a decent living, and all of a sudden Truffaut and Louis Malle and these guys make her the first lady of French cinema. So they're, they're, in, they're making their own generation of actors. They're telling them, don't come in with your usual makeup on. And they also got rid of some of the union positions. They weren't real popular with the unions in the main, because they would say, <laughs> would say, we don't need a costume designer. They're just going to bring their own clothes. We don't need a makeup person. They're going to look like somebody does when they've just had sex all night and they get up in the morning. They shouldn't look like they've been made up by somebody professional. Um, so, so they get rid of a bunch of those things. They want it to look natural. So the dialogue tended to be spontaneous sometimes, a lot of jargon and contemporary uh, lingo. Uh, the music was usually jazzy, something that kind of fit the loose structure of these movies. They didn't follow all the editing rhythms. So if you're using jump cuts and mismatches, you don't want classical music fitting it. You want jazz and something that's, that's kind of jarring. So they really put together a sort of casual look and a different kind of story with new actors, and they really built their own varied styles. Everybody's films looked a little different, but they were all they were all fun, lively, and felt like something that was made today in the world they lived in. And you, I mean, going back and watching those films, they 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 seem still even contemporary today. Uh, the style that they were doing, they were doing the kind of editing they were doing back then, uh, and even the camera work and things that they were doing, oh, yeah. is it's still fresher than a lot of the stuff I see today. Oh, let me give you an example. There's this guy, Jacques, uh, um, oops, sorry. Um, there's this guy, uh, Jacques Rosier, who makes a Gia Philippine. And they were shooting on the beach, and they couldn't get the tripod to stay in the sand. So he had the camera operator stand up on a chair behind him and put the 35 millimeter camera on his head, and the director became the tripod. Uh, for another scene they were doing in a small apartment, he wanted the camera to pull back, and they're like, well, we don't really have anything. So they had somebody, they put the camera operator on like a kitchen chair up close to the character, and they had a guy in the corner pull the rug back so that you got this slow camera movement that pulls back. It's just a guy pulling the rug underneath the chair that the camera operator's sitting on. So yeah, you do that kind of stuff. They regularly, Truffaut especially, regularly liked to um, use cars where he would like, they would just turn the car off and use it as a dolly. And you'd have guys just sort of put, the camera operator would sit on the hood, and then you'd just push the car down the street. So you'd get traveling shots and tracking shots and things that were cheap. You used one of the, one of the cars by one of the guys on the crew. Um, you didn't relay tracks, you didn't use trains. Uh, you just shot where you could. And you used whatever you had at the, at the time that you had it. Exactly. There's a real famous shot in The 400 Blows by Truffaut where you've got this high angle shot of the kids walking down the street. And Truffaut just like went up to see, he said, you know, we need a high angle shot from up there. So they went up and they actually knocked on doors and they found somebody who they said, can we, can we prop our, t our tripod out your window? And there's this great shot of them like leaning out the window on somebody's Paris apartment, shooting down to the street. So yeah, they would just do all kinds of, you know, impromptu things. They didn't have to pay anybody to do that. Uh, they didn't buy a crane. He says, well, if I just start with a high angle shot from a window and then I come down and shoot from the street, it's almost like a crane shot. You go from here to here, I'll cut it down and you just, you just forget the camera movement. So yeah, they're editing, they're shooting in ways that they're really trying to, you know, have, have jarring new effects for what they saw as a sort of new era of post-war uh, European culture. So the rule. So obviously, these these filmmakers were rule breakers. Let's go over so everybody understands exactly sure. what's going on. What are some of the rules that they changed? We've kind of glossed over them, but specifically, what are some of the rules that they they broke, which were hard hardcore rules, like engraved in cement or on 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 uh, on uh, yeah in cement. Yeah. Well, ima okay. Imagine a scene for your, for your audience. Imagine a scene where a young man, young woman, they're not quite sure if they're a couple yet or not and having a conversation. Classical Hollywood or even commercial French cinema, you got an establishing shot. She's on one side of the room, he's on the other side of the room, and an establishing shot. Then you're going to go in for a shot, reverse shot. She says, boy, you know, I didn't expect you to show up today. Cut to him on a different thing. You shoot at all her shots together, then you shoot all his shots together, and you edit to back together with shot, reverse shots. The new wave is going to do all that maybe in one or two takes. And they might just start of start on one character, or suddenly discover the other person's actually in the room, pull back a little bit to show them both. So you'd have just the camera is almost like a documentary filmmaker or a news camera operator. You're trying to sort of capture the movement. So there was a sense of an, they saw it as often as an honesty. 
they just felt like many of these rules, the 180 degree line and eye line matching and the sort of editing continuity editing rules were just sort of made up to, you know, make everything the same. So they each would try to think about interesting ways to, to put the camera in different places. Same thing with sound. They shot a lot silent because they figured, well, you know, we're going to have our characters having an argument in this tiny little French elevator. The noise, it's not, how are we going to get the sound in there? We'll just have them, you know, them and the camera crunched in there, and then later on we'll dub in the sound. So some things where they used sync sound and live sound out in the streets, other things they would dub it in afterwards. Um, so they're not restricted by the rules of what's professional. And some of the critics at the time said that. These are unprofessional films. I can't believe this is winning a film festival award when Claude Chabot has got people driving down the Champs-Élysées in Paris having a conversation with the top down in a sports car, and you can tell the voices weren't really recorded then. Uh, it becomes one of the top movies. The Cousins becomes one of the biggest movies in Europe that summer, and a lot of the professionals are saying, he's breaking his rules. The sound quality was uneven. You could tell it was mic'd in a studio, not on the streets. Um, the people going to it didn't care. It was lively and it was fun. And again, they were sexy. They had a lot of movies about you know young couples in in bed, at a time when American cinema is very restrictive, and you got right. Doris Day, Rock Hudson, you know, kind of dr dr comedies. Uh, some of these things, Jules and Jim with the love triangle, the Catholic Church is going to condemn it. So they were seen as you know not just rule breakers in terms of where you put the camera and how long a take is. They were also in terms of what your content is. So the, and these were essentially low budget films. Uh, these were not. Yeah. What were what were the, were the you know, what were the budgets of some of these films? Uh, typically fifty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars, kind of that range. Which sounds like you know okay, but the average French film was about a half a million dollars or three hundred to four hundred thousand. So they're made at a lower budget. But here's the deal: if you want it, it's not just young writers and actors and directors. It was also a new generation of producers. So if you're going to make a $400,000 movie, for example, in France, uh, it's kind of risky. So what they started to do was decide, hey, somebody would say, I got $100,000. I'm going to give it to these two people I met. They'll each make a $50,000 movie. If either one of them makes some money, I'm doing better off than putting all of it into one $400,000 movie. And then mm -hmm. they start to win these awards. So again, Claude Chabrol, Claude Chabrol's grandmother died, left him like $65,000. What's he do with it? Instead of buying an apartment or doing whatever a traditional bourgeois person would do or investing it, he buys, he, he, he starts a film production company and he starts making his own, his own first film. He had a drawer full of scripts, like a lot of people should. Uh, so he starts shooting a movie, but he only uses part of it because he gets this state grant to cover part of the production money, and then he finds a producer to put in a third of the money too. So he's kind of co-producing it with someone else. The French government's giving him a, basically a low-interest loan. So then he takes some of that movie money he didn't use, and he lends it to a friend to start making his first feature film. So he takes his $65,000 money, uh, makes it into Handsome Serge, Beau Serge, his first film. It wins a top prize at a film festival, starts to make money. He starts to shoot his second film, The Cousins. Within three months, he had two movies open in Paris, France, and they both were hits. So they're shooting fast, they're shooting furiously, and at the same time, he's got two friends who are now making their first feature films. So they helped each other out. They even lent each other's, uh, you know, they would say, oh, my camera operator is pretty good, I'm just finishing up, why don't you use him? Um, so you had these same cinematographers burning to shoot with no artificial light, or on location with not much of a shooting script, uh, who were spontaneous. Some of them came out of documentary and news photography and got into it. Um, so you've got a new generation of cinematographers too. So it's very low budget, shoot fast, use outside money whenever you can, get rid of any official union people, they would make appeals, can we please shoot this film? Uh, they had to get approval from the, uh, the, the National Cinema Board mm -hmm. uh, to get rid of certain positions. So they're doing everything on every different level to really make movies in a different way. And I think in a digital era, it's really, you know, everybody can make a movie today. Uh, you can upload it to YouTube, obviously, and other places. But if you want to get it distributed and really seen out there, you also have to find daring producers and distributors who will pick them up. Now, speaking of distributors, how would these films distribute? Because I'm assuming, well, distributors today are not very uh, open-minded nor forward-thinking. So uh, I could only imagine what uh, distributors in, in Europe were in the 1950s. Yeah, how did these, they, like how do when the 400 blow shows up uh, how is how is that going to be like you know breathless how is that going to work yeah so um what typically what's what happened was like the 400 blows it won a top prize at the con film festival so it's kind of like a sundance win um he didn't have a distributor um, he actually made this movie for like $55,000 they make it he gets accepted at the con film festival partly cuz he's a really famous 
cr uh, critic already, uh, but he gets accepted there. He wins a top prize. He, j the North American rights alone, Canada and the United States, was around $100,000 for a $50,000 movie. So he's doubled his money before it showed in a movie theater uh, anywhere, and then you start to get distributors competing for it. Um, that leads to other people getting excited about young films, etc. So Claude Chabrol has already gotten a distributor. Uh, Eric Romer makes his first film. Nobody wants to distribute it, but then he starts to go to art film circuits. So you can do it a number of different ways. France has this sort of circuit of art films at the time uh, that you could just basically four wallet. Uh, but a lot of them get picked up because of the f film festival wins. And then a new generation of distributors comes along. A bunch of these things are distributed in the United States by new young distributors who are distributing Fellini movies, Ingmar Bergman movies, uh, things that are outside the normal circuit to an art film circuit here. Uh, and they're, on the, they're out there looking for new racy stuff. Um, so they're, they're distributed not by 20th Century Fox or Warner Brothers, but they're being distributed by really a whole new generation of European art film distributors around, and, but they have a bunch of different contracts. Agnes Varda, who we lost this last year, uh, Agnes Varda was a really good example with Cleo from 5 to 7. Um, she's going to get the, make this movie because her husband Jacques Demy had just made a movie, and that distributor said, or that producer said, hey, you know, what, what's your wife doing? You know, and she's like, well, I, I, I've got this movie. So he approved her really cheap script. She shoots Cleo. Um, he's going to bundle it with other new wave films. So it got distributed in the United States. With He sold like a Godard, a Jacques Demy, and an Agnes Varda film were all rolled together that, dis, that an American distributor would then buy. So they're kind of coming as a cluster. They're good friends who help each other out. And that also makes it a wave because there, it's not just one or two people individually getting picked up. They're all kind of in a, in a package. Uh, so Truffaut, Godard, Eric Romer, Claude Chabrol, Agnes Varda, Jacques mm -hmm. Demy, uh, there's a whole bunch of people like that who are now on the cover of newspapers and magazines. Esquire. There's a Ed great new way of edition of Esquire that's got like caricatures of all the, a lot of the new wave actors and directors on its cover saying Paris is, is the place to be right now in the movie world. So they were just, these became like icons of a new generation. They were like, you know, they were like jazz stars or something. And it was also a time when there wasn't as much uh, a te much competition for our eyeballs as there is to in today's world. Exactly. So you could make a bigger exactly. splash back then because there just wasn't a whole yeah. lot else going on. It's, not to take it's, anything it's, away, not to take anything away from them. But yeah, no, it's very, no, it's very true. Though I mean, what was on TV? I mean, French television had like one or two channels at that point. Right. We just had the you know the standard Mr. Ed kind of stuff. Um, and this was, this was, yeah, just very jarring and very different. So, yeah, you're not competing. They're not competing with MGM musicals. They're not, they don't want to compete with that stuff. Uh, they're not trying to make Star Wars on the cheap. Uh, what they're trying to do is have a whole new kind of product that somehow connects with their generation as well. Now, do you... Do I think it's short-lived. Right. And, and do you think that there, the French New Wave had a direct correlation with the renaissance of the 70s uh oh, especially yeah. here in the in the states where you have milius you've got coppola you've got scorsese you've got spielberg and you've got you know there's so many others de palma from, from cassavetes on yes yeah um and in fact i mean Truffaut was trying to do bonnie and clyde uh they were right. coming over to talk to him about oh how about do, and jean-luc godard people were asking him to make movies in america and he would sometimes take the upfront money and then not do anything um <laughs> it was a bit of a, <laughs> a scam sometimes but uh but yes they're really strongly doing that um that that a lot of people are being influenced by them i think the graduate you know one, oh. one of the biggest movies in the 1960s it's it's really uh, the first half is kind of a new wave movie like benjamin what are you doing i'm just floating right he has no plan he has no thing it's about this youth uh, he doesn't want to play the game. Um, so I think a lot of these things, Mike Nichols, a lot of people were strongly influenced by the, the new wave in the 60s, certainly by the 70s. Yes, they're looking back to this uh, to this kind of era as a golden moment in uh, in world cinema to a certain extent. So, yeah, I think it strongly influences things. What is a script? Who gets to make a movie? Who gets to produce a movie? Who should be an actress? And by the 70s, we get a lot of those anti-heroes and even women actresses that are not classically beautiful mm -hmm. uh, in the certain way who become really hot stuff in certain movies. So I, a lot of that comes from the French New Wave kind of impulse. It strongly affects American independent films of the, of the 70s and on. Now, can you talk a little bit about what uh, the two specific sections? One first about how they use the camera in such a special, unique way 
when breaking the rules and then also the editing language because they literally changed editing and the editing language with multiple not one or two little things uh, but they added a bunch and same for the camera so can you talk a little bit about how they uh, how they influenced us sure the cinematographers typically are going to use very lightweight cameras uh, and again they have the freedom in some scenes to shoot silent so they're gonna have the a lot of, of uh, and this goes in with editing sometimes you get a lot of montages of people running through the street the streets or the famous uh, Godard scene in Ben Tapar where they run through the Louvre and try to set a record of how quickly can you go through the Louvre Museum uh, that you shoot a lot of that stuff silent so the camera operators can be uh, can not only be really mobile getting into elevators they're also the first ones that I know of who the camera operators start to use non-conventional things not just sitting on the hood of a car and being pushed down the street, but wheelchairs. I mean, that's another thing. People made fun of them. They shot in wheelchairs, the camera operators. Well, by the mid-60s, every film school in America has wheelchairs. Uh, people say, oh, well, if they can do this stuff. So they're shooting in wheelchairs. They're shooting uh, in Godard. There's a famous example, and Jacques Demy does the same thing in one of his early movies, Lola, that they actually hide the camera operator inside of a, 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 news, of a, a, a postman's cart. So you've got this big cart, and the cinematographer sits in there, cuts a little hole to stick the lens out, and they get pushed down the street, and they make a movie where nobody knows a film's being going is going on. So you get a casual interaction with people just wandering past, and it feels natural because it is. But you also get a camera pers perspective, almost like Ozu standing up a little bit. Um, you get a new perspectives and mobility. So mobility, camera mobility was huge. Move the camera around, um, and then the editing would often try to tack some of those long takes together. But they do other things. Jean-Luc Godard famously used a lot of jump cuts, which is basically you take one 30 second shot and then you snip pieces out. So it's like, it almost is like a visual stuttering. Uh, well, within a couple of years, they're using it in beer commercials, right? I mean, it gets picked up for nonfiction purposes. Commercial start to do some of these things as well. So yeah, having people uh, repeat their actions. In The Graduate, I'll just use it as another example. There's a scene in The Graduate where Mrs. Robinson walks naked into a bedroom and Ben turns his head three times. Well, it's a quote of an Eisenstein movie from the 1920s, but the same kind of thing is gonna happen in Truffaut and Godard and other places where the real time of how many times did someone turn their head, um, it, it, there's no way to say it. So they're gonna break up the sort of real time and space sometimes with editing, call attention to editing as manipulation. Um, and also use that to help really set the rhythm in a way that maybe the script would in a more classical movie. So the scene to scene structure is usually a little different and cut from thing to thing. Uh, it's a little more jaggedy and raggedy. The camera work might look unprofessional, but it keeps moving. But yeah, you use editing, but you just cut from one thing to another and you don't worry so much about smooth transitions uh, in the way that having a continuity person, they didn't always have a, a what was called a script girl in the old days, a continuity person making sure that the, the, the glass of beer is half full in every shot for the same scene and things like that. So a lot of times there are mismatches and there are so, and that was, kind of a scene as honesty. We're making movies here was important to the French New Wave. And then they also, um, I, I, from my studying of it, um, a lot of times they, where you normally would use editing to create tension in a scene, they would just use the camera as whip pans and, and, and just kind of, yes. so if there's two people in a room or something like that, they would just jump with the camera as opposed to normally that would be an edit. Well, Hitchcock would obviously use an exactly. edit all the time, but they, exactly. they wouldn't. Yeah, people should just watch the first 10 minutes of Breathless, for example. You've mm -hmm. got a shot of him, he's just, he's driving his car. Boring scene, right? He's driving his car. And then you just, you, you see him like talking to himself, but he, you look out the hood as if it's his point of view shot, and suddenly there's like a, a British petroleum gas truck, then another car, then something else. Well, in a normal movie, you would cut back to him smiling or looking bored, then cut to a truck, then cut to a car, then cut. So he just took out those sort of interim shots. And it, he said, a lot of times Godard would say, I edit my movies like a Dick Tracy comic book. Like the whole notion, you go from from image to image, from panel to panel, page to page. Um, he, he wants to call attention to the editing, whereas Hollywood, you're supposed to hide your cuts, uh, have dialogue or music cut over them. So it just seems logically like there's an impossible, an, an, a little imagined helicopter is there invisibly taking shots or something. He calls attention to the soundtrack. Line up. Um, and, and so it, it was really a modern, a very modern way of making movies that wasn't seamless. It was seen as, again, amateurish in some ways, but it's not just some poor student movie. They usually had really good taste in what they're building and why. Uh, and again, I think they're still some of the most exciting movies out there. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. I was watching, recently watching some again, and, and you're just sitting there going, 
my God, this is this is fresher than the stuff that's going on right now in a lot of ways. You know, it, it you know, it, I, I feel that I feel there's been multiple generations that have forgotten these films and forgot this movement. Yeah. And because there might be a stigma because, oh, that's what they teach you in film school. So it must not be cool. Um, but and they're black. I, and they're black and white so oh my god they must not you know that's not that's like citizen kane i'm like no no and citizen kane has its own thing this but, is better uh, than citizen kane. much <laughs> much better than citizen kane in my opinion as well but i wanted to i wanted to talk about this on the show because i think there is generations of filmmakers who don't understand the the what the rules that they broke back then Mm-hmm. That if literally if I if I made a, a brand new French New Way film right now in the exact same way, it would be fresher, um, and we could do it so much more, such e- yeah. e- and with such ease today with the technology. I mean, it's insane. No, it's true, and it's true. And I'll just give another good example, like Agnes Varda's Cleo from Five to Seven. She, the whole movie, for people who haven't seen it, as any scriptwriter, I think it's a great, great model. You've got a woman who's uh, who's waiting for a cancer test. So basically, she's killing time for about an hour and a half. And every scene is like, every cha- has, has a chapter number, but it also has a timing on it. The ex- precise, it's got European time. So like, you know, 1543 to 1548. So if you're, so you're gonna have these specific times. Um, so it fo- every scene lasts exactly as many minutes as the title says it's gonna last. And yet within it, so it's got continuity, but in the middle, it's, there's gonna have to be this discontinuity. So at one point she walks down a sidewalk, she's a pop singer, she's worried, and suddenly you just have all these images, some of them from previous parts of the film, and you don't know, is she imagining all these things? Is this the narrator interposing them? Um, but it's just this brilliant rhythm of all these just still, still shots and moving shots and stuff as she just walks for, out of a cafe a little frustrated down a street. Um, so they break up really the whole notion of like, you know, what is time? Uh, is it long and, and continuous? Is it all mental subjective and montages? Uh, it's both. So yeah, they're really exploring time and space. And as Jean-Luc Godard said, where you start a shot and where you end a shot, that's the essence of cinema. Uh, they really thought about this stuff and, and, and we're having fun with it at the same time. Now, what is camera stylo? Ah, uh, camera stylo, yes. Stylo, the, stylo. Stylo is like a pen. In the 1940s, there's this other theorist, he's a critic, um, a friend of Andre Bazan, and he wrote in some of the real leftist uh, journals, even during the war, some of the illegal uh, publications. But this um, uh, Alexander Ostruk wrote a famous article, it's really short, whenever I show it to students, because they've heard about it, it's only like 12 paragraphs, but it basically says, he's calling for the camera as pen, the camera stylo, that basically in the past, the great minds used a pen to write, today the great minds will use portable cameras to write. So basically he's saying, think like a novelist, don't think like old filmmakers. Um, think you, know, you will write with your camera. So it was really a notion of sort of freeing up cinematic thought, freeing up cinematic language, don't be bound by all the grammar rules you've learned. Um, so it was really trying to say our whole generation, we're gonna think and express ourselves differently through cameras. Um, and through the cinematic mode. So it really was a World War II and, and just after this new faith that everybody's disgusted with the war and previous generations, that basically if you're a creative individual and you're 20 years old, your medium is not to write a novel or write a play, it's to make a movie. Um, so the, it really sent this new generation, they loved that idea, we are going to tell our stories with a camera out in the streets. So it sort of motivated a lot of that. And Agnes Varda later on talked about she's a, you know she called herself uh, somebody who's a cine écriteur. She was a cine writer, um, and her, she would even say this film was cine écrit. It was cine written. So there's this real sense of you know we are a new generation. The film is a new language, and frankly, you know we're we're going to be able to tell new stories because of the apparatus. Um, so it's really just rethinking the power of the cinema, the function of a camera and a microphone. And all of that one thing, but it, this camera stilo became this idea of just like you compose a novel, you compose should compose a movie. Yeah, and and I feel that there's one director, contemporary director, that kind of uh, encompasses everything the French New Wave has to, to offer. Um, and I, and one of the reasons why his films are looked upon with such reverent reverence is Tarantino. Um, yeah. he, you could look at you could look at the scenes and I mean I've you just you just catch the shots I mean he's he's famously unapologetic about stealing shots uh, in stealing full concepts and 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 he's wonderful at what he does he's a master but you see scenes like in Kill Bill 
Django Unchained, even uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. They're just straight up shots from the French New Wave or inspired by the French New Wave. Even the chapter points at the beginning of his, his movies. No, that's very true. In fact, that yeah, that you know, that Band of Power Productions. Yeah, there's this this real <laughs> this reverence for Godard and, and and a certain period of his life. No, it's a, and I think what's important is the playfulness. A lot of these new wave films, people act like oh, you know, it's like going to a museum. You got to watch this seriously. No, they're being silly. They're being funny. And Truffaut's uh, shoot the piano player. You know, somebody says, oh, if I'm not telling the truth, may my you know may my mother die. And then you cut to some woman falling over. I mean, they they were playful. Uh, at the same time, and I think that aspect of Tarantino uh, really owes a lot to it, much less those tracking shots that go on and on and on. Um, with the Once Upon a Time, I had students say, Not, they just drive around and walk around. And, you know, this would be a new wave guy would say, exactly, you know, that's the <laughs> essence of cinema. How you cover somebody moving from point A to point B, that is cinema. Uh, much, But also that scene of uh, when the Sharon Tate character is watching herself in the movie theater. Yeah. It's a real new wave scene, you're right, because there are a lot of movies, they go to movies a lot in the French new wave um, as well. So no, I think there are lots of Tarantino uh, aspects that, that pick up on the new wave, pick up on art cinema from all over the place. And that's why I, I just think any independent filmmaker needs to know not just recent American independent cinema and be able to talk about their Jarmusch's, etc. Uh, and Miranda July kind of stuff, but they should also be able to talk about European alternatives, Pol early Polanski. I mean, Polanski was inspired by the French New Wave, too. He said, Cassavetes he's and Cassavetes. Yeah. He's a young guy in, in Warsaw saying, wait a minute, Paris is really expensive. If they can make a $50,000 movie there, think what I can do here in Warsaw, you know, where everything's really cheap. So he's, they inspired people around the world of their generation and subsequent, but I think it still is one of those things that the French are always saying, oh, is there a new wave on the horizon? I mean, it's become a mythical era that just will never be replicated, but it's been incredibly influential and important in lots of ways. And you were saying um, about them being playful. I'm not sure if they were the first. I doubt they were, but they definitely brought it to the attention of breaking the fourth wall. You know, they weren't the first to break the yeah. fourth wall, but they... No, that's true. Other people had done it before, usually in comedies, not in the middle right. of a chase scene. <laughs> right. uh, but certainly, I would say in, in uh, Pulp Fiction, oh. when she says, don't be a square, you know, that's the kind of thing that a French New Wave character would do. Uh, acknowledge, you know, the, tick, 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 the little dots, of the, the little lines mm -hmm. on the screen. Acknowledge there's a, there's something between the camera and the actors. Mm -hmm. There's an apparatus. That to me is a real new wave kind of moment as well. So, yeah, it's funny, it's silly, and it calls attention. Reminds us, we know we're what we're making a movie. We know you're watching a movie, and you know it's just a movie. Uh, the French New Wave was always about that. We're telling stories with cameras, our yeah. camera stilos, uh, and it, and just calling attention to it. the soundtrack would come and go. The music would boom in and then just stop mid frame. Um, and stuff, and just kind of remind you, this is fun. We're at the movies, and the movies can be fun and smart uh, and challenging. Now, what are the biggest lessons that today's filmmakers can learn from the, the generation of the French New Wave? One, I think, know your history so that you have a sense of where you come from and you don't create those cliches. Um, also, though, I think, make what is your movie? You know, a lot of times, and I'm sure you've seen this with you know filmmaker wannabes and students who basically they each, they have one or two filmmakers they know and they like, like a Tarantino, like a Wes Anderson, like right. a, and they want to write scripts that just become like little shadow versions of those. Yes. Instead, you do what you want. So the new wave, Claude Chabrol is going to tell very personal stories that are about him and his life. Um, he's going to make his first film. He goes back to where he spent time as a kid growing up during World War II, and he uses friends from that that he made back then. Now they get to act in his movie. Oh, that's very different than Godard, who's going to go out and try to find, you know, hip new actors and actors to be, actresses to be in his vision of a movie. Um, but they all look different, but they tell personal stories that to them matter in one way or another. So rather than replicating formulas, these are not movies where you can, like, look at right the, the midpoint and say, oh, here's the <laughs> midpoint in the script. Yeah, no. They don't have beats in the same way. They all are organic and personal. And I think that's real important, that you they, they pick topics that they can afford to make. They pick topics that are important to them. They use friends and others as positive influences on them. It's a group project, not one individual's notion. Um, I think those things are really useful, but especially know your technology. What do you have access to? What can you do well with it? And what kind of rethink from it? 
how do you how do you say okay how can I use this camera and not have it look like what everybody else has done with the same red camera um, can I do something different so kind of thinking about the technology uh, that's really what they were fascinated with is sort of pushing it there there's in I we keep coming back to breathless I guess because it's one of my favorites sure. but true uh, but Godard at one point told uh, Kutar his cinematographer the cinematographer is like, you know, this film is just not fast enough for the scene you want to shoot here at night. We're going to have to get some new film stock. And I'm saying, we don't have time to get new film stock. Let's shoot it now. And he says, I don't care. I, I want to hear it scream on the screen that, you know, as the film feels like it's being overexposed or underexposed. That notion of pushing the film to do something it never did before, um, that's a sort of new wave notion. And, and with digital, it's a little different these days, certainly. But I think, yeah, rethinking digital cameras um, and trying to rethink how the technology and the story you're telling and your aesthetic choices all kind of come together to make something creative and new. It doesn't have to be revolutionary, but it should be new and interesting. And personal. And I think that's always the best. Authentic and personal, it's always, even if it's an action or a thriller or something, if there is some sort of authenticity from the filmmaker inside, I think that's one thing that the film, the French New Wave directors have is each of their films has a little bit of their DNA in it, without question. True. And they knew the skills. They had skill sets. It's not like they were naive. Um, they knew the skills. They knew they were breaking rules. Uh, it's not like they just grew up. But they, you know. But yes. So they're personal in that way too. That they say, okay, I know how to do a shot reverse shot. I'm choosing not to. So I'm going to do these alternatives. Uh, same thing with storytelling. I'm not going to tell you all the psychological background on this character until maybe late in the film, or maybe not at all. Uh, so the scripts really left people guessing too, like, why is she with this guy? Or why is he just suddenly leaving her? I thought that was the one thing he wanted in his life. You don't answer all those questions. So the storytelling too was something that left ambiguity and left openness in a way that genre films did not of that era. Um, and I think early 60s films were very generic, very formulaic. Uh, and this stuff just seemed like it was coming out of, you know, who knows where. Now I'm going to ask you the toughest question of them all. What are your three favorite films, French New Wave films of all time? Oh gosh, um, I do think Breathless. Uh, I can watch it over and over, and I teach it over and over. Um, Truffaut, I gotta say, Shoot the Piano Player is stunning. Yeah, it's uh, great. Piano Player yeah. is his least popular one at the time it's got a really raggedy kind of rhythm it's got the best shootout in history talk about i mean making no sense spatially but it's emotional uh near the end and uh agnes varda i think le bonheur by agnes varda it's a beautiful color movie that is just about a young married couple happy married couple and he finds another woman on the side and it's one of those lush uses of color at the era ever ever so i think agnes varda's happiness le bonheur Cleo 5 to 10 is very good too. Um, Shoot the Piano Player and, and Breathless are all very different movies, and I think any potential filmmaker can learn a lot from any of those. And where can people find your books uh, on the subject if they want to dig a little deeper into the French New Wave and how they can, that can help them today? I do have the uh, history of the French New Wave cinema. Uh, it's at Amazon and all over the place. Um, it's one of the best-selling, luckily, uh, things. I also translated a book called uh, the, uh, the, French New Wave, the French New Wave by Michel Marie, uh, which is a much more concise thing about economics and things. Uh, but yeah, history of the French New Wave is pretty easy to find now. Uh, it used bookstores as well. Don't want to just plug Amazon. Uh, it's out there as well. Richard, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking shop about the French New Wave and how can it and how it could help filmmakers of today uh, rethink the way they're doing things and may, maybe maybe create a new wave. I think we're we're due for yes. a new a new wave. There was that there was the Dogma ninety five. There was the um, the Mumblecore movement. Yeah. There, yes. was, there was few mini movements. I think we're due. We're due for something new. We are. I think in American independent cinema is great right now, and it's getting better and better. Again, uh, there is a new renaissance, I hope. Anyway, thank you. This was great. I haven't talked about the new wave in a while. This is wonderful. Thank you, Richard. 